Thank you. Welcome back to the House Education Committee on Wednesday, February 17th. We are uh, doing a, a walkthrough of H106. Um, this is the community schools bill and um, Jim Demery is gonna walk us through the bill and then we will welcome uh, Heather Boucher, the deputy secretary who will uh, give us some, an idea of where the, the, the administration's response to these efforts. So welcome, welcome back, Jim Demery. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you too. Sorry I've been away so long. Yeah. I'm very distracted by other things. Um, <laughs> so uh, Jesse, can I sh share the screen? Yes, Jim, you are all set as a co-host. Okay, thank you. And let's see. Yeah. Okay. People see this. Yes, no? And if you can't, you can find it on our website. Okay. Okay, so for the record, Jim uh, DeMarco, we are walking through draft 2.1 of your um, committee amendment to H106, which deals with uh, community schools. Um, so the uh, title and the findings have not changed from before. Uh, so I won't go through those in detail. Um, I'll go right to the heart of the bill. And this bill was about 18 pages before, and now it's down to eight pages, I believe. Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> so the purpose here, uh, line nine, is... Uh, to support a pilot program for the implementation of uh, community school programs that provide students with equitable access to a high quality education. Um, so we have definitions, but many, many fewer than before. We have the uh, community school coordinator definition, uh, which again, to remind you as a full part-time uh, staff member, serving in a uh, eligible school um, or SU uh, and is responsible for the identification, implementation and coordination of a community school program. So this bill is now all about hiring that position. That's what this bill does. Um, grant funding to facilitate the hiring of that position. Uh, the community school program it's the same as before, it has the four elements. I won't go through them again, but integrated student supports, expanded and enriched learning time and opportunities, active family and community engagement, and collaborative leadership and practices. So the four elements are the same as before, and together they define uh, the community school program. Okay. Um, the uh, eligible school, again, is unchanged, but to remind you, it is uh, a uh, public uh, elementary or secondary school that has a student body where at least 40% of students are eligible for free or reduced price lunch, uh, or has been identified for comprehensive or targeted supports. Higher um, grant means the grants under this uh, section. So here's where it's changed. Uh, we have two very short sections now. B uh, is the authorization. So it says the Secretary of Education is authorized to provide annual pilot grants of $110,000 a year for a period of three years for each eligible school to hire a community school coordinator to develop and implement a community, community school program. So uh, that is uh, three years worth of funding for each eligible school to help cover that cost. Grant administration is uh, the Secretary of Education, so I'll minister the pilot program, uh, will develop the grant application and provide funding on or before December 1st of each of uh, 2022, 23, and 24. Um, if the amount appropriated is insufficient, it can be prorated. 
and the secretary may deny or reduce second and third year grant funding if the secretary finds the applicant has made insufficient progress for developing and implementing a community school program. And then the agency has to provide technical support, so uh, provide information and support uh, and help identify funding sources that might be available. And then the use of grant funding uh, has changed, changed uh, to um, an eligible applicant should use the pilot grant funding to hire a community school coordinator to develop and implement a community school program. Uh, during the first year, the uh, coordinator uh, shall conduct a needs and asset, assets assessment of the school to determine what is necessary to develop a community school program and an action plan to implement that program. Then in the second and third years of grant funding, the community school coordinator shall oversee the implementation of the program. And then there's an evaluation section that says at the end of each year of grant funding, the three years, at the end of each of those three years, each eligible applicant that received funding shall undergo an evaluation designed by the agency. And then at the end uh, of the program, uh, the agency will report back to you. Appropriation uh, funds is unchanged at 1.529 million from the education fund. And uh, aside the one percent for uh, informational informational and technical assistance, and uh, two percent for the evaluation that's required. And the effective date is on passage. Okay, thank you. I, I, I just uh, want to just alert folks that uh, this right now is a grant program in this language, looking at using the Ed Fund. I want folks to just hold a little bit of the conversation about, about the financing, because um, obviously this is something that would be appropriate for um, the CARES funding. Um, so we're gonna to try to focus a little bit more on the, on the program and then we'll sort out all that money later. Um, Representative Tuve, did you wanna say something yeah. before we go? I just to have a question. I can't find the... You did now. I can't find the updated draft on the website, and all I can find is the as introduced. Okay. Uh, it just it was just re if you refresh the committee page, the documents part you'll see it. Ah, there it is. Thank you, thank you, Peter. <laughs> okay, um, Secretary Boucher, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I know that you just recently got this draft. And um, we're interested to hear it. We do know that the secretary had mentioned something about full service schools at one point. So uh, we're, we're interested to see if there's something we can work out here. Yes, uh, thank you. For the record, uh, Dr. Heather Boucher, Deputy Secretary for Education. Happy to be here this morning with you all. So um, in general, uh, I think we really do like uh, many components of this bill and certainly um, strongly support um, the findings and purpose. Um, certainly, it's critical that Vermont's education system work collaboratively with other entities to ensure that students are healthy, both physically and mentally, and ready to learn. Uh, in addition, we certainly support district efforts to work collaboratively with families and all staff and educators to bring about these goals. We also agree that an approach focused on our most vulnerable families and students is definitely appropriate um, in this area. So my comments are um, not uh, voluminous because as I said, in general, we support the components. Uh, we support many components of the bill. I think the punchline is how to make sure that uh, our existing and just about to be um, happening efforts around uh, recovery align with um, the work of this bill. And so I hope to actually assist in um, how that might look. Great. Um, so um, as you know, this bill is framed around four pillars um, detailed in a report by the Learning Policy Institute. And this framework is uh, interesting and definitely compelling. Um, I would, I would um, 
just want to say that significant work under at least two of the pillars is already underway. And that's kind of what I alluded to just a moment ago. So as part of our state education recovery process um, and plans that will actually be required um, from our LEAs, and that guidance is coming out uh, within the week, LEAs are going to be required to identify uh, a, a recovery team um, at their supervisory union or supervisory district level and a point person for interfacing with a local state team that is assigned to them to assist with recovery. And this you may remember from when um, we came and talked about uh, at a 30,000 foot level, what the recovery uh, planning would look like. So the state teams are going to include um, ideally staff from agencies and obviously AOE, but also mental health and um, children and families. That's our goal. So that we're actually bringing to bear um, a pretty um, individualized uh, support team for each LEA, depending on uh, what their needs assessment around three different buckets um, for student outcomes shows. So that's kind of a review just to give you, just to remind you of that. And those buckets just really quickly are social, emotional health, mental health and well-being, uh, truancy um, or student hopefully re-engagement or engagement and then academics. So um, given that this structure is going to be in place uh, as a part of COVID recovery, um, we advise taking up the community school coordinator piece next session uh, and, and really mean that. Um, as I, I spoke with um, Representative James, uh, really, really mean that because we do see a lot of promise in this bill, but we just wanna make sure we kind of tee this up so that it makes the most sense given what um, LEAs can lift at this time. So um, we advise again, taking up that coordinator piece next session because this will be the timing when LEAs will have already put into place the underlying structure at the district level that can support uh, school level positions such as our um, uh, um, conceptualized uh, in the bill. So that's one of our pieces that we would um, urge discussion of. Um, and then the second pillar, expanded learning time, of course, including after school, before school, summer activities, is also an important component of um, certainly robust education systems that we definitely support. Uh, we urge the committee to review the report from the Universal After School Task Force that is also imminent, as I understand, um, before launching this component of the initiative, because uh, this group has been meeting for the past several weeks on this very topic. And it makes sense to incorporate that work into this bill before fully moving forward. And hopefully that's not surprising um, to folks. Um, and then collaborative decision-making, um, the third uh, or the fourth pillar actually is a core component of robust MTSS, multi-tiered systems of support uh, systems at the, at the LEA level. So, we suggest that this strand of the bill perhaps interface more directly with um, our MTSS uh, statutes that we already have on the books because it, it really parallels a lot of um, one component of that uh, system. Finally, we agree that not enough state level or systemic focus um, currently exists in Vermont on how to best engage parents and families. And I would say Professionally and personally, it's it's long been um, a puzzle to me because historically a lot of great work on family engagement has been happening right down the road in Massachusetts at Harvard, and we never have seemed to uh, make that connection. I think simply because we're we're just swamped always, um, but we really are excited about that strand, and the, and it really is a gap. Uh, we would argue as well um, from a statewide or systemic perspective. So um, we support efforts that strive to better um, improve communication and outreach to families, particularly those who are most vulnerable. And um, we don't really see, we see that there's a real need and um, a current gap for that um, definitely um, at the moment. So then just in terms of a few considerations specifically about the grants, um, Definitely, we agree with the focus on historically marginalized students. But one thing we would caution is that um, 
perhaps consider removing the language about identification for comprehensive school supports under ESSA, and I might not have that exact wording correct. What that might do actually is if we use that as a required criterion for um, these grants, it could actually unfortunately have long-term effects on how um, federal title dollars can then be spent. Um, so we need to be careful about that. So that's really just a kind of a nitpicky thing. Um, but anytime we actually require something from the state, it, it, narrows, our, um, it narrows our ability then to use um, federal dollars for that. So, so to keep it kind of the way the other um, components under that section are about um, based on um, poverty, based on need, just keeping it like at that level, we would recommend. Um, and the other thing, a couple more points, um, I think as the committee knows, at the Agency of Ed, we've been working to bolster a district or SU focus in all of our initiatives to best ensure equity among schools, both within each district, SU, and then across the state. Um, and in addition, it's not really schools who would be applying for funds because they're not fiscal agents on their own. So we urge consideration of the target to be school districts for this grant funding um, or, or regional collaboratives of districts or um, schools for this program, um, as opposed to a focus that's really on a school by school paradigm. Um, that's kind of what we have right now. And so we're hoping to actually have a more um, systemic approach where, where we can be assured that all of our schools have components that are part of um, a community schools framework. So I hope that makes sense. And then the last piece I would say, um, there's just one section that seems to read as though a predetermined sum of funding would automatically go to each school. And we would recommend that we just, that the bill just keeps it at a more um, overall appropriation level so that then individual, again, consortia or, or um, groups of districts or even a singular district could actually apply based on their own individual needs. Again, they're gonna be doing a needs assessment for these three outcomes for students as part of recovery. And um, as, as you all certainly know, uh, the needs um, around systemic supports uh, vary depending on the geography of our state, depending on what's already been set up um, at the district level. So we would, we think it's actually a better use of our res of taxpayer resources to actually have that global sum and then allow the budgets to actually drive um, the, the, uh, the applied, uh, the application budgets to drive um, how much money actually goes to that um, local level. And that very well may have been the intent of um, the grant, but there was just one piece and I can, I can um, send Jim that component that kind of struck me as being at a little bit of odds with that. That's all I have. So happy to take questions. Thank you. Questions? Representative James, and then Randy. Thank you. And um, thanks so much. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> thank you so I much. I know you want to say, Heather. It's OK. Uh, sorry, that's why I bogged down. I, anyway, I, I was trying to be formal. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so a lot of, I think this is a lot of really important and great feedback. Um, I have a global question and a specific question. Um, the bill was envisioning, a, you know, as you said, a kind of a set mount for each district or for each community school coordinator. And I had wondered about that, you know, level of funding um, that maybe that wouldn't be appropriate. One of the things that I thought about was, well, should this be rolled out at the district level? But then I worried that that would undercut the entire concept, you know, of neighborhood schools and community schools. And that if you start looking, um, like, say, I think about um, Taconic and Green, um, where, you know, the schools and the communities within that district are, are really different. And they have very different levels of free and reduced lunch students and different community needs and different community resources, you know, from from Danby to, to Manchester. So what do you 
what do you think about that? And then I'll get to my second question. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I apologize if my um, testimony on focusing at the district meant to imply that all schools within a district would have the same characteristics or would, would be uniform, because that's definitely not the case. Um, so we would definitely want to um, continue to afford attention to that um, uniqueness of schools. And I do think that's a real critical part of the bill and we agree with. However, just factually, um, there can't be grants awarded to schools. That's just not how our dollars work right now. And um, we, we, we would still argue that it's actually incumbent upon the broader district to actually take responsibility for what's happening in those schools. So to really honor their variability and honor what's unique and special about them, but also have an eye toward um, the incredible inequities that we see um, across you know, schools within a particular um, SU. So I think that there's a way we can do both. And I did not want to imply that this is really a way to um, steamroll uh, the school voice or, you know, uh, falsely make them all the same. That's not really what I'm trying to communicate. So you, you could see a world in which um, there's a community schools coordinator working at the district or SU level who is still nonetheless rolling out or implementing a different version of the program that meets each school's needs. Yes, that's one model. It also could be a model where there is a community school coordinator at each school, but they, they do have to come together um, at a district level in some way to actually um, work together and collaborate. Okay. Um, and then my second question, and then I'll, I'll get out of the way, is that, um, so you and I had already spoken, so I, you know, I certainly wasn't surprised by any of your comments that you see some of the work on these three pillars really being kind of underway in a parallel universe this year, you know, the after school task force, and that you don't want to complicate or um, duplicate that work elsewhere. So I guess my question is, in your perfect world, um, would you see a portion of this, like, you know, any one of these pillars, maybe the community and, or maybe the parent engagement being something that we could start working on this year or move forward in some way this year so that everything is not waiting? Um, so that if we, you know, what can we do this year to make sure that if we move a different bill next year, everything comes together and that parent engagement piece of it hasn't just been dead in the water. So absolutely. You, and that's actually what I was trying to, oh, sorry. I didn't mean to. Um, that's it. I, what, thought, I thought you were finished. <laughs> uh, I, I'm never finished. <laughs> but <laughs> what yes, that could do now. Yeah, that's exactly it. So I think, um, you know, we really support um, moving forward with um, some attention to uh, student or uh, family participation and engagement, because that's not something that any existing to our knowledge um, statewide initiative is focused on. And we also um, really support um, the collaborative um, decision-making and um, leadership model that is, I think the third pillar. We just wanted to say if, you know, moving forward, we support, it's just perhaps take a look at what's already in MTSS, but it wasn't meant to say pause, there's a lot of work happening on that. Really for us, mm -hmm. the big one um, that is, um, you know, the biggest, I would say yellow flag is the actual um, position, which I know is the meat of the bill, but it's because we're actually, um, you know, planning to be, you um, Help, helping districts use their ESSER funds to set up some of these underlying structures that I think next year we would have a much better sense of, and then it would actually improve the bill a lot more because you would have a better sense of like what model would work better. Would it be a district level um, coordinator who would be responsible for all the schools or would it be as the bill is currently written. No, actually it makes sense that there's a coordinator within each school, but they all report to in some fashion, um, the district to make sure that they're all aligned and, and integrated. So that's kind of, um, that's kind of our, our biggest, um, if we have a concern, it's that piece because we want, you know, 
we're going to be requiring under the emergency order that schools do some of this work. It might not be called the exact same thing, but what we're going to require as part of education recovery from the pandemic will actually tee up the next set of this, which we would see as a much more permanent um, component of a well-functioning education system. Similarly, um, after school has not really been um, after school has this other work going on with it in terms of universal after school, which does overlap to some extent with um, recovery, but it's also kind of standing alone. There was a lot of work already happening on universal after school and extended time. So for that, um, we just wanted the committee to make sure that they take a look at what that um, working group's gonna come out with in terms of suggestions. Does that help clarify a bit more? Okay. Great, that was my intention, so. Representative Brady. Thank you. I, th I think this is kind of following in the same line. Thanks so much um, for all of your feedback on this uh, of where we were. And I'm, I'm thinking especially about those recovery teams and the work that's gonna happen in every district. Um, and I, I see your point about, you know, not wanting to kind of duplicate or overlap um, roles here. On the other hand though, I wonder, does, will those, task forces, those, you know, those re-engagement teams, obviously they'll come with some state staff or resources, but are there, and you, you alluded to this with ESSER, but are there, are there, is there new money that districts are going to have to do that work? Because it's going to put a tremendous amount of, of new work on existing staff. Um, and so I'm, I'm concerned about the capacity. And, and so it makes me wonder if there is a place for this in this year, and that maybe we have a couple districts that are kind of piloting sort of turbo recovery, like a turbo, you know, having extra coordination, uh, an extra way to, to tap into resources in a community. And, and clearly we wanna target it to communities we know that are gonna have high needs. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of, we've heard some testimony from um, districts where they have no in-person learning happening at grade levels, um, you know, places like that where there's, where there's gonna be such a need. I'm not, I guess I'm not convinced that there isn't a, a need to do <laughs> even more than, than what the, will be the sort of the bar across the state. Sorry, that's kind of a muddled question, but I'm, I'm trying to see if there isn't still some place for it here. No, uh, no, it's actually a great question. And it's one that I was just thinking about as I um, took another quick peek at the bill. Um, so it's hard to say, um, so, so our vision is that um, superintendents will be using, you know, and their teams will be using ESSER dollars. Um, part of that we had already anticipated would certainly be for hiring staff. Some districts, for instance, are probably gonna need to hire some folks if they can find them to go find students who, who have kind of been lost. Um, so, so this could definitely be part of that for sure. Um, it's just unclear to me at this point how much would be needed. So I don't think that's, um, I don't think that that's a, no, that's a terrible idea. I just think we don't know yet, like how those funds are all gonna shake out. So I guess we might be comfortable if we say, um, let me think about that more, but look, I could see like, you know, we could also put into some of our guidance, like, you know, consider um, uh, um, school and or district-based um, community schools, uh, coordinator in our guidance that's going out. Because I think that would be part of um, the universe of, again, what we would anticipate. So I think that there are ways to integrate this. Um, I, I'm not, you know, I, I don't want us to come across because that's not what our intention is to say, um, there's no way to integrate. It's just the devil's in the details. And so I'm happy to kind of think through that. And we don't know yet what the dollar amounts would be. I think that's the tricky piece. And I think that the committee is, is aware of that. And I'm kind of putting the, the money aside at the moment as, as we certainly, so I don't think we need to get particularly specific about any finances because that's gonna be emerging. Um, we just know it's gonna need some money. <laughs> we don't know how much, um, we don't know how we're gonna do it. But, but if we can get the, the, the tenets of, of what we're trying to do down, I think would be helpful. Um, Representative Austin. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm wondering about going to the parent engagement, family engagement. Um, I'm wondering if there could be 
a, a hybrid model in terms of offering parents Zoom and in-person uh, connections. And I'm just wondering if you, if the agency has collected any data during COVID to see if family engagement increased because um, it was more convenient to do it in a Zoom conference than in person? I don't know if we specifically have um, collected that. Um, it's possible some of the Vermont um, advocacy groups have, depending on what their particular um, frame of mind or perspective is. Um, but anecdotally, I would say that Yes, we have heard that um, just like with some students who are actually doing better um, mm -hmm. in a remote or hybrid perspective uh, or paradigm, there are, there are some places where they have seen an uptick in um, family engagement because it, it isn't just about having to schlep into school. You can actually hop on. And, you know, I, I think we've seen a lot of that with um, local uh, school board engagement, for instance. So moving a lot of... Um, if, well, moving pretty much all of uh, local school board meetings online, I think has, um, from what I understand, again, I don't have the data on that, but from what I understand has really increased significantly the amount of uh, community participation. So I think um, those are really good ideas and um, hopefully would be part of um, the framework as we move out of the pandemic. Like what are we, part of like, what do we wanna keep about, you know, things we had to do during COVID-19, uh, uh, during that sort of response that we actually want to, want to, want to keep as part of our, um, you know, system moving forward, because they actually, you know, none of us would have ever wanted to say there were good things about a pandemic, but they actually worked pretty well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Representative James, is that a, a new hand? <laughs> it is a new hand, and it's just for a quick comment, um, which is to sort of say or remind, um, it, this is just, it goes to um, Rep Brady's comment about, you know, could we do some, could we turbocharge some schools? Um, and, you know, just a reminder that this is really just intended to be a pilot grant program, you know, not a statewide initiative that's mandatory for all schools and all districts. So, um, you know, I, I'd love to see some uh, schools or districts have the chance to try this, um, you know, next year under a grant under a pilot structure. Thank you. I think uh, what is so interesting about this concept, um, we have a waiting study, which at some point will likely be implemented um, with some re-weights on students in poverty. And just looking at ways that um, districts that could see additional dollars coming their way, um, you know, that it might not just be about tax rates, but might actually be addressing some of the underlying conditions. And as we know that um, poverty is a community problem, it's, it's, it ends up in the schools. Um, so the, the interest in this is really to address some of our longstanding issues. And also, I think some of us have been to a few schools that are considered community schools. And it was really moving, um, seeing what was happening there, that it was a community, uh, at the community engagement was really, really moving to see what was going on, as well as the students. So um, it, it's an exciting model. Um, I really appreciate that the, the administration is, is working on some of these things related to uh, our recovery and the fact that we do have a lot of ESSER dollars that will be going to schools. So I, I guess what I would, I would ask perhaps is um, if a, a few of you could get together, I think maybe Representative James and Rep Representative Brady were, were working on this to, to uh, maybe sit down with, if you would be available again um, Dr. Boucher, and yes, uh, absolutely. To sit with with um, Jim Demare and see if if uh, something we could work uh, something out in this regard. Um, so that would be be very helpful, and um, and I think that would be it for now. Unless there are any other questions, uh, Jim Demare just wanted to see if there was any anything that you needed to. Say or, or ask of 
uh, Dr. Boucher at this point? No, not at this point. I think I think we can get together uh, as a small group and and work this out. That'd be the best way forward. So happy to be involved in that. This would be to go into the cafeteria and <laughs> grab some lunch and see if you can figure it out. Um, That's it's now a a, break, a chat room, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. um, and I think that, that that would be helpful. It's difficult to do it with in, in a whole committee. Um, I can I could start an email to get the four of us together. Great. Perfect. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. And wow, we're ahead of schedule. <laughs> There's something for you. Any other just thoughts about, about this from the committee? And then I'll give you a little break. Uh, 10.50, I think we were going to take up um, the uh, the um, current action related to parochial schools. Um, anything from anybody? Okay. Uh, and, and excuse me, is uh, Peter Teachout joining us?